Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel, I myself, will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May we join our hearts in prayer. God of grace, God of mercy. So much is going on in many of our lives. It's busy, it's hectic, and help us, Lord, to let our souls catch up to you today. May we take a deep breath in your presence this morning in worship and be reminded again that you are here with us, and wherever we are, you are there. Lord, this day let us be present to your presence with us always. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our rock, our refuge, our savior, our redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. When I first started preaching on a somewhat regular basis, I was scared to death to do it. (laughs) And I remember the lead pastor with whom I was working at the time telling me, tell stories, 
Just think of it as telling stories. So that's what I did. And now about 20 years later, I'm going to spend this morning telling stories with you and inviting you to step into those stories with me and hoping that we'll all begin writing some of our own. The first story is the scripture rating I just shared with you. It's entitled The Conversion of Saul in many Bibles. It's a significant story for the life of the church. It's told three times in uh, the book of Acts. It's the story of Saul, who was spending his life uh, persecuting people faithful to the way of Christ, binding them, as scripture says, men and women, bringing them to the religious authorities that they could be questioned and imprisoned and, in the case of Stephen, stoned. In today's story, Saul is traveling in that murderous fury to Damascus to continue his Spanish Inquisition-like approach of persecuting Christ followers, followers of the way, as it was called. And on that journey, he's blinded by this bright light and led by the hand then into the city. He was blind for three days, not eating or drinking, And at the end of those three days, one of the followers of the way came to visit him where he was staying. And as I was growing up, I remember hearing this story told again and again. And it's the visit from this follower of the way that I found even more fascinating than the conversion of Saul. And so I have thought many times I'd like to rename the story, The Mercy of God. The Medal of Ananias, or like today's sermon, Mercy and Dangers, just ask Ananias. God calls Ananias to make this visit, and he responds, Here I am, Lord, when God first calls. And after he has agreed to do whatever it is that God's going to ask him to do, then God tells him the mission, which is to go to Saul, the persecutor, And lay hands on him so that he will be able to see. Again, I can't imagine Ananias' thoughts. What? Ananias said yes before he knew what the job would be. But then he doesn't sound so sure. Saul, he responds. But Lord, I've, I've heard of this person. He has committed evil things against your followers like me he arrests and puts in prison people like me people like me hide from people like Saul we don't go to their houses and knock on the doors and find where they're staying and offer to help the Lord responds to the concerns of Ananias by saying go he will be my instrument to spread the gospel go Scripture doesn't say much about the interior struggle of Ananias or how hard or frightening it was for him to do what God had called him to do. Scripture simply says he did it. Psalm 23 has that verse in it, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. But very few of us want to take that literally. We don't know how hard or frightening it was for Ananias to leave his home that day. Did he tell his family goodbye in case he wouldn't see them again? We don't know how hard or frightening it was for him to knock on that door. Was he hoping no one would answer? We don't know how hard or frightening it was for him to tell Saul his name and who he was. Did Ananias want to hide his faith that day? And we don't know how hard or frightening it was for him to touch his enemy with his hands, to lay hands on him and offer to help, hands then touching a person who had persecuted people just like him and assisted with the stoning of Stephen. We don't know how hard or frightening it was for him to call Saul a brother. 
How do you address your enemy with kindness and mercy and kinship with no proof of whether that person has changed? I can't imagine being Ananias that day, making that visit. How does one get, as Barbara Brown Taylor puts it, so wrapped up in living God's life and following that call that we forget to protect ourselves? Forget to look out for danger and forge ahead in faithfulness regardless of the cost. I wonder. And through those faithful actions of Ananias, God healed Saul of his blindness, filled him with the Holy Spirit, had Ananias baptize him, sent him out to spread Christianity, not imprison it, and what was their known world. And Ananias had to do what he was called to do so that Saul could do what God had for Saul's future. I cannot imagine being Saul that, I mean, Ananias that day. The story makes me uncomfortable when I read it. It tells me that following Christ faithfully means putting ourselves at the disposal of God's mercy and love. It means reaching out the way Christ reaches out. It means the risks of Christ's mercy will be risks we take as well. It means the mercy of God may be bigger than I want it to be, calling me to go to places I may not want to go and people I may not want to meet. It means dying to ourselves in order to live for God, which is something we rarely stop to take seriously, or at least I do, so seriously that I would knock on an enemy's door and call him a brother and put my hands on his shoulder in grace. Are there real live Ananiases these days? Do people do that? Do we say yes to God without counting costs? Do we say yes to God only when it's comfortable? Do we say yes to God only if it fits in with how we want life to go? Do we say yes to God only if it doesn't require us to change our hours or our clothes or our finances or our hearts or our address? Do we say yes to God only if we don't have to make too many sacrifices. Don't have to call someone brother or sister whom we despise or fear. Don't have to love our enemies. Don't have to get over ourselves or make Christ the center of our lives or don't have to take up a cross. I wonder. Back when I was a youth pastor, I remember some parents wanted me to tell their children about Jesus so that their kids would be nice and behave and live a good life. (laughs) They were not prepared for their children to fall in love with Jesus Christ and be changed and take their whole family on this wild ride of a life turned upside down by the radical nature of Jesus Christ's mercy and love and grace. But I saw it happen. God is so cool and interesting like that. (laughs) Mercy and dangers. Not only by calling us to reach out to someone we may fear, mercy and dangers, what we thought was normal. Lives of security and comfort and easy answers and prejudice we're afraid to challenge and more. Are there real, live Ananiases these days? Do people do that? I can think of a few. Queen Esther comes to mind in the Hebrew Scriptures. Dietrich Bonhoeffer comes to mind. Martin Luther King, Jr. Rutilio Grande, Oscar Romero. A few other people I know. Let me tell you some of their stories. 
Oscar Romero was a Catholic priest in El Salvador, one of the most dangerous places in the world. When he was first assigned there, he initially supported and catered to the wealthy and the military officials of the corrupt government who helped sponsor the church. Then his friend, the priest Rutilio Grande, was martyred, along with other priests who were fighting for human rights and those oppressed by the government. And then Romero saw, not long after that, at a peaceful demonstration of thousands, the military came and opened fire on the poor and impoverished gathered there in that community. And after those things happened, he felt called by God to speak out against the violence and injustice and human rights violations and began to stand with and for the poor. And as a result of that change of focus, extending God's mercy, he received death threats from those in power. And during that time, he'd give these weekly radio addresses, and this is part of one of those, and I quote, Dear brothers and sisters, especially those of you who hate me, who defame me and know it isn't true, be converted. I love you deeply. I ask the faithful people who listen to me with love and devotion to pardon me for saying this, but it gives me more pleasure that my enemies listen to me. I know the reason that they do is that I bear them a message of love. I don't hate them. I don't want revenge. I wish them no harm. The Christian faith does not cut us off from the world, but immerses us in it. The church follows Jesus who lived, worked, struggled, and died in the midst of it. End quote. Father Romero was shot on this day, March 24th in 1980, while offering communion at an altar at a funeral service in a hospital. There goes someone being so wrapped up in God that he forgot to protect himself and forged ahead into faithfulness, mercy and dangers. Just ask Oscar Romero. Let me tell you another story. Someone I'll call Helen. Helen received word from a mission organization about the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo last year in this. They needed healthcare workers. When she heard the call, she said, here I am, Lord. It's the second worst Ebola outbreak in history. As of March 18th, there were 903 confirmed cases, 606 deaths. Ebola is both deadly and highly contagious. But Helen had said, here I am, and so she left her comfortable home to go and serve in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the sweltering heat of Africa in 12-hour shifts under unimaginable conditions. She and other healthcare workers like her had to wear these rubber-like suits like raincoats that covered them from head to toe to protect them from contact with the deadly disease. They had to be taped into their shoes and their gloves to prevent any possible breach in those protective garments. But as it was, the disease was greatly misunderstood in the community and the people would wait too long before they'd bring patients in. And so many patients came into the clinic, but very few came out. And local persons started to distrust these foreigners who had come in to help and began to attack the clinics. And many of the healthcare workers were victims of that. And as Helen was volunteering in these conditions, she went day after day after day until one day there was a breach in her protective suit while she was treating one of the patients. I remember getting a message from my friend asking me to pray for her survival. She lived, but there goes someone so wrapped up in God that she forgot to protect herself, right? She forged ahead in faithfulness, mercy and dangers, just ask Helen. A final story. One of my dear, dear friends, whom I will call Stephanie today, 
She left a secure life as a nurse manager with a comfortable salary to become a full-time missionary with virtually no salary. She has served in more third world countries than I can name. And in 2015, she was called to go to El Salvador, still one of the most dangerous places on the planet. A place where gang violence in the last few years alone has taken the lives of over 20,000 people and counting. When my friend was called by God to go, she said, here I am, Lord, use me. And off she went to share faith and teach English in this small, isolated town where violent gangs ruled daily life. And she told me about an incident that happened one day. She wasn't feeling good. She hadn't slept well the night before, and when she woke up that next morning, she was grumpy and impatient and had a short temper, and she was trying for all she was worth to protect certain kids in that community from the gangs. And that morning when she went to teach her class, she saw one of those prominent gang members with one of those young men she'd been trying so hard to protect. And he came in, and her short temper erupted, and she said, are you in my class? To that gang member. And he said, no, and she said, then ciao, with an attitude. And that meant to him, get out, scram, get out of here. And when those words came out of her mouth, she said the air dropped out of the classroom, and every one of those students gasped. She, a woman, had spoken dismissively to a male gang member, and she, a foreigner at that. My friend said she realized immediately her mistake, and she knew everyone in the room knew her mistake, and they all knew the penalty for such an infraction was death. My friend said she didn't know what to do. She said to the class, let's take a break, and she ran outside the classroom, and she went to hunt down the gang member, and she said she went up to him and said, I am so sorry I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. Please forgive me, which, of course, he didn't want to do. And then Stephanie went back in to conclude with the class. And at the end of that day, when she went to the place where she was staying, she called her close family members and friends and told us all a final goodbye. And then she waited for the next day when she knew the gang member would come for her and those like him. And they knew it would happen in public and they knew it would be in front of the class so that they would know that the rule of the day still remained. But it rained that day. My friend said it rained so hard, it poured, and she was so happy that the rain was falling from heaven. In that culture, people believe that evil spirits were in the rain, and she said they just don't come out. So she said, I knew that the gang would not be out that day because it was pouring. And she walked around all day so happy that it was pouring. And then the next day, she went in and out of the city, with protection day after day after day and every day she watched her back and she completed her term in El Salvador and returned home. She told me recently she can't wait to go back. I said, you are crazy. (laughs) But there goes someone being so wrapped up in God that she forgets to protect herself and forges ahead in faithfulness. Mercy and dangers. Just ask Stephanie. From these stories, it does not appear that following Christ is for the faint of heart. Ananias could have told us that. Oscar, Helen, Stephanie. Are there real live Ananiases these days? It would seem so, though I'm not sure I'm ready to be one of them. Some days I want to follow Jesus with all that I am and all that I have and all that I will ever be. And some days I want to just stay home. What about you? (laughs) To what is God calling you? What work of mercy? How is God stretching you? What story is God writing in you? I wonder. The call of God on each of us may be so different, but Christ died so that we would be free to pursue it, 
and be faithful to the one who gives us the task. God's love for us is what got this whole trouble with mercy started in the first place. Look at the cross. Mercy and dangers, just ask Jesus. Christ has invited us to take up a cross as well and follow wherever he would lead, wherever he would send. May we too get so wrapped up in God that we follow it faithfully. Amen.